Hey there, classic car fans. The 1950s were a golden era for American automobiles, with chrome-covered beauties and tail fins galore. But not every car from that decade was a masterpiece. Today, we're taking a look at three of the dumbest and worst cars that rolled off American assembly lines in the 1950s. These cars might have had high hopes, but they fell flat in design, performance, and public reception. Let's jump right in. First up is the 1958 Ford Edsel, a car that has become synonymous with one of the greatest automotive flops in history. The Edsel was Ford's ambitious attempt to create a brand that would bridge the gap between its mainstream models and its luxury Lincoln division. With high expectations and substantial investment, the Edsel was marketed as the car of the future, promising advanced features, bold styling, and a driving experience like no other. However, what was intended to be a game-changing vehicle quickly turned into a cautionary tale of marketing missteps and design miscalculations. The 1958 Edsel's design was one of its most polarizing aspects. Ford aimed to make the Edsel stand out from the crowd with a distinctive and futuristic look. The most notable feature was the infamous horse collar grill, a vertical oval-shaped front grill that was meant to be a signature element of the car's design. However, instead of being seen as innovative or stylish, the grill was widely ridiculed by the public and the press alike. It was often compared to a toilet seat or even a horse collar, and this unflattering association did significant damage to the car's image. In addition to its controversial design, the Edsel was also priced higher than many of its competitors, which made it difficult for Ford to attract the middle market consumers it was targeting. This high price point, combined with the economic recession of the late 1950s, further hindered the Edsel's chances of success. Consumers were unwilling to pay a premium for a car that, despite its innovations, did not deliver on the promise of being the next big thing in automotive history. Despite its commercial failure, the Edsel was packed with technological innovations. It featured several cutting-edge features for its time, such as the Teletouch transmission, which allowed drivers to shift gears with buttons located in the center of the steering wheel. The car also had self-adjusting brakes and a speedometer that changed color as the vehicle's speed increased. However, these advanced features were not enough to overcome the car's negative image and high cost. Another factor contributing to the Edsel's downfall was the inconsistent quality of the vehicles produced. Ford rushed the Edsel into production, leading to numerous quality control issues. Many Edsels left the factory with defects, and their reliability was quickly called into question. These problems only added to the car's growing reputation as a failure. The Edsel's launch was also poorly timed and poorly executed. Ford introduced the car with great fanfare, creating a level of hype that the vehicle simply couldn't live up to. The extensive marketing campaign, which included teaser ads and grand unveilings, set expectations that were impossible to meet. When the Edsel finally hit the market, the public's reaction was overwhelmingly negative, and sales were dismal from the start. Ultimately, the Edsel's failure was not just a result of its design or pricing, but also a combination of market conditions, poor timing, and unmet expectations. The car quickly became a symbol of overhyped failure, and Ford discontinued the entire Edsel line after just three years, in 1960. The Edsel's demise was a costly mistake for Ford, resulting in significant financial losses and a lasting mark on the company's reputation. In retrospect, the 1958 Ford Edsel serves as a powerful reminder of how even the most well-intentioned and well-funded projects can go awry if they fail to resonate with consumers. Today, the Edsel is remembered more for its place in automotive folklore than for its actual contributions to the industry. Its legacy is one of ambitious innovation that, unfortunately, fell far short of its lofty goals, making it one of the biggest automotive flops of the 1950s. Next on our list is the 1957 Dodge Royal Lancer D500, a car that perfectly illustrates the age-old saying, don't judge a book by its cover. At first glance, the Royal Lancer D500 was the epitome of 1950s automotive style. 
With its striking design featuring bold tail fins, sweeping lines, and plenty of chrome accents, the Royal Lancer was a true head-turner. It captured the spirit of an era that was all about optimism and futuristic design, symbolizing the American dream on wheels. However, beneath that glamorous exterior, the Royal Lancer D500 harbored a host of mechanical issues that quickly turned this dream car into a nightmare for many of its owners. The Royal Lancer D500 was introduced as Dodge's top-of-the-line model, intended to compete with other luxury cars of the time. It came equipped with the powerful D500 engine, a 325 cubic inch V8 that was designed to offer strong performance and a thrilling driving experience. On paper, this engine was impressive, boasting up to 310 horsepower in the Super D500 version, which featured dual four-barrel carburetors. The D500 was marketed as a performance-oriented version of the Royal Lancer, promising speed and power that would satisfy even the most demanding drivers. However, in reality, the engine's performance was marred by a series of reliability issues. The D500 engine was known for being temperamental, with frequent breakdowns and persistent mechanical problems. One of the most common complaints from owners was the engine's tendency to overheat, which could lead to significant damage if not addressed promptly. The overheating issues were compounded by the fact that the car's cooling system was often inadequate for the demands of the powerful V8 engine. The transmission was another weak point in the Royal Lancer D500. Many owners reported frequent transmission failures, which were not only inconvenient, but also costly to repair. The car was equipped with Dodge's Torque Flight Automatic Transmission, which, while advanced for its time, proved to be less than reliable in practice. Transmission problems ranged from gear slippage to complete failure, leaving drivers stranded and frustrated. These issues tarnished the car's reputation and undermined its appeal as a reliable luxury vehicle. Rust was another major concern for the Royal Lancer D500. Despite its stunning exterior, the car's body was prone to rust, particularly in areas like the fenders, door sills, and undercarriage. This problem was exacerbated by the fact that many of the cars were driven in areas with harsh winters where road salt accelerated the rusting process. Over time, rust could cause significant structural damage, further diminishing the car's value and making it even more difficult to maintain. The combination of mechanical unreliability, transmission failures, and rust issues meant that the 1957 Dodge Royal Lancer D500 quickly gained a reputation as a car that looked great, but was a nightmare to own. Many drivers who were initially drawn to the car's flashy design and promised performance found themselves facing constant repairs and maintenance headaches. The D500's glamorous appearance could not compensate for its shortcomings under the hood, and as a result, it failed to live up to the high expectations set by Dodge's marketing. In hindsight, the 1957 Dodge Royal Lancer D500 serves as a cautionary tale in the automotive world. It's a prime example of how even the most visually stunning vehicles can fall short if they lack the mechanical reliability and build quality that consumers expect. The Royal Lancer D500 may have dazzled onlookers with its stylish design, but for those who actually owned and drove the car, it was a source of frustration and disappointment. Today, the Royal Lancer D500 is remembered more for its aesthetic appeal than for its performance or reliability. It remains a symbol of the 1950s automotive design ethos, but also a reminder of the importance of substance over style in the world of cars. While it's still admired for its looks, the 1957 Dodge Royal Lancer D500 stands as a lesson that what's under the hood matters just as much as what's on the outside. Rounding out our list is the 1953 Packard Caribbean, a vehicle that was envisioned as the savior of the Packard brand, but instead became a symbol of its decline. The Caribbean was introduced during a time when Packard, once a prestigious name in the luxury car market, was struggling to maintain its relevance in an industry that was rapidly evolving. The Caribbean 
with its eye-catching design and high-end features, was supposed to capture the attention of affluent buyers and restore Packard's position as a leader in luxury automobiles. However, despite its extravagant appearance, the 1953 Caribbean fell short in several critical areas, ultimately contributing to Packard's ongoing difficulties. The Packard Caribbean was a bold statement in automotive design. With its sleek flowing lines, prominent grille, and distinctive rear fender extensions, the car was undeniably striking. It was offered exclusively as a convertible, with a limited production run of just 750 units in 1953, making it a rare and exclusive vehicle. The Caribbean was also one of the first American cars to feature a wraparound windshield, a design element that would become more common in the years that followed. Inside, the Caribbean boasted a luxurious interior, complete with leather upholstery and chrome accents, reinforcing its status as a high-end vehicle. However, despite its visual appeal, the Packard Caribbean struggled to deliver the performance that its looks seemed to promise. The car was powered by a 327 cubic inch inline eight engine, which, while adequate, was considered outdated by the standards of the early 1950s. This engine produced 180 horsepower, which was respectable, but not enough to compensate for the car's considerable weight. The Caribbean's heavy body, which contributed to its solid, substantial feel, also made it sluggish on the road. Acceleration was mediocre, and the car's handling was cumbersome, especially when compared to some of its more nimble competitors. The outdated engine and lackluster performance were significant drawbacks for a car that was supposed to represent the pinnacle of luxury and engineering. Another major issue with the Packard Caribbean was its price. The car was marketed as a luxury vehicle and its price reflected that positioning. With a sticker price of around $5,200 in 1953, equivalent to over $50,000 today, the Caribbean was one of the most expensive cars on the market. This high price tag put it out of reach for many potential buyers especially at a time when other automakers were offering more modern, better performing vehicles at lower prices. The Caribbean's cost was not justified by its performance or features, making it a tough sell in a competitive market. The failure of the 1953 Packard Caribbean was a significant blow to the Packard brand. The car's inability to live up to its lofty promises highlighted the challenges that Packard was facing in an industry that was rapidly moving forward. While the Caribbean was an attempt to recapture the glamour and prestige that had once defined Packard, it ultimately fell short, serving instead as a reminder of the brand's waning influence. The car's poor sales and lukewarm reception underscored the fact that Packard was struggling to adapt to changing consumer preferences and technological advancements. In many ways, the Packard Caribbean symbolized the beginning of the end for Packard. The company continued to produce cars throughout the 1950s, but it was clear that its best days were behind it. The Caribbean's failure to rejuvenate the brand marked a turning point as Packard struggled to keep pace with its competitors. By the end of the decade, Packard had merged with Studebaker in a last-ditch effort to survive, but the brand's decline was irreversible. The Caribbean, once seen as a beacon of hope, became a footnote in the story of Packard's demise. Today, the 1953 Packard Caribbean is a reminder of a bygone era in American automotive history. It's a car that's admired for its bold design and luxurious appointments, but also remembered for its shortcomings. The Caribbean represents the challenges that even the most storied brands can face when they fail to innovate and keep up with the times. While it's now a rare and collectible piece of automotive history, the 1953 Packard Caribbean also serves as a cautionary tale about the perils of resting on past glory and failing to adapt to a changing world. And there you have it, three of the dumbest and worst cars in America from the 1950s. While the 50s gave us some unforgettable classics, these cars missed the mark and are remembered today for all the wrong reasons. What do you think? Did we miss any? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our deep dives into automotive history. Thanks for watching and see you next time.